I was having so much fun. Do we have to do something here? <laughs> well, am I on? All right. <sighs> Greetings. Greetings and welcome. We are going to um, start a little slowly because usually one or two more people uh, arrive in the last in the uh, couple, first couple minutes. I'm Checker Finn with the Fordham Institute. Uh, I used to run the place. Now I track Mike Trilly and uh, and and uh, harass him from time to time. Um, we appreciate your being here today for uh, I think a terrific opportunity with uh, with Miriam Friedman to talk about her I think e exciting, provocative, and contentious um, uh, and very nicely written uh, book. I should say before we go further, since we are being videoed. Uh, I have to give you the Twitter information, uh, the, the, the worldwide audience. Um, it's uh, hashtag is special ed 2 pt0. Special ed 2 pt0. Um, and we will welcome questions from the worldwide audience. And if anybody in the room is too shy to voice their question, I guess you can tweet it. Uh, it may or may not reach me that way. Um, this is, I don't, don't do Twitter myself. Um, glad you're here. Um, 16 long years ago, we at Fordham, jointly with the Progressive Policy Institute, produced a very thick volume called Rethinking Special Education for the New Century, uh, suggesting that special ed as we knew it, this was in 2001, was, was seriously uh, in need of a major overhaul. That overhaul in these last 16 years has not occurred. Arguably, the uh, issues that we thought were problematic at the time have become more serious uh, in, the, in the years since then. Uh, no overhaul has occurred. Uh, and um, Miriam, with Special Education 2.0, uh, is prepared, to, is making a pretty compelling case for an overhaul. Uh, she's been at this for a while. She is a veteran public school educator. She is a teacher. Um, she is a lawyer. She's been in special ed for as long as I've known her, certainly. And as you can tell, neither of us is exactly young. Um, and uh, her book is also um, going to be sold at the end of the session uh, when you've earned your cocktail and snacks as well for an incredible bargain price in the back of the room, is should you... Uh, uh, should you like a copy? Um, and uh, we're not going to do this as a speech. We're going to do this as a as a Q and A format. Um, we are here in the context of about two hours ago, the uh, House of Representatives, by a very narrow margin, uh, voted to repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, I have the faintest idea what's going to happen to that, and we're not here to talk about health care, but we are here to talk about whether um, repeal and replace. Um, is the right way to think about special education, or fine tune and tweak. Um, and I'm going to make that my first uh, opening salvo to Miriam. Are we here to repeal and replace? Are we here to fine tune and tweak? Some of both, some of neither, something in between. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, door three. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really happy to have an opportunity to talk about doing something about special ed, which is important, and my book is about that. So I am not repeal and replace, and I am not tweak. But I am coming to you actually from Silicon Valley, where I moved just recently. I used to live in Boston. I was a hearing officer and lawyer there. And so the name of the book is Special Ed 2.0. In Silicon Valley, everything gets named a new name. So we have Apple One, Apple Two, Apple, et cetera. But it's very interesting. As I was talking to people about the book in other parts of the country, they said, oh, 2.0, is that like a grade? And it's not a grade. It's the fact that I believe what we need to do is take the incredibly powerful and good and successful parts of special ed law. We begin with the notion that special ed was signed into law by Gerald Ford in 1975 at the time when many students were excluded from school just because they were disabled. And the ones that weren't in excluded, many of them sat in the back of the room with no services. That is not happening now. And I think we should all pat ourselves on the back, have balloons, 
and cherish the fact that we have come a long way in a successful law. So you say, why don't we just go home and celebrate? Um, and the problem is that as we have been successful, we have also gathered more and more steam of dysfunctionality and problems uh, in how do we implement the law, who gets served, how much it costs, how many kids, the whole gamut. And so my view is um, take what's good from the old one and rewrite and do a new law. But it's not repealing the old one because I believe special ed has been a successful law, not one that needed repeal. So you are not reversing special ed. Right. You are, however, going to suggest what sounds like a major overhaul. Is yeah, that can fair? I, can I show you an analogy? You can try. Right. I'm going to show you an analogy. This is an advertisement from the Wall Street Journal that I laminated. I don't know if it will show up. But some of you who are old enough to remember may remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was our president. I mean, I wasn't around, but he was our president. I think president. I had been born. Yeah. And apparently, um, people suspect that he had polio. And in the 1930s, he started the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And then an actor renamed it the March of Dimes, which was brilliant. And people sent many dimes to find a cure or find a vaccine for polio. So from the 1930s to the 1950s and 60s, they succeeded. And we have the Salk and the Sabin vaccine. And then the question is, what is March of Dimes going to do? Are they going to keep looking for a polio vaccine? And they changed their mission. Now it's called March for Babies, and they basically work for premature babies and other babies who are struggling in the very early days of life. So my, that is really my model. We succeeded, and we need to change our mission. That's really where we are. So we could, we could and we will get into what's actually uh, problematic about special education as it is practiced today. But one of the more uh, interesting and provocative points in your book is that special ed as we work it today is not good for general education as we work it today, nor for the future of public education as we know it today. Um, and it's, this is relevant because, as you know, uh, 18 months ago, Congress uh, did pass a pretty substantial overhaul of the main federal law having to do with general education right. um, and um, making some big changes in what had been No Child Left Behind and is now the Every Student Succeeds Act. So talk a little bit about, uh, before we dig deep into special ed, what's not, what's, what about it is, is negative from your standpoint about general education and public education? Oh my God. Um, have I said enough about what's good about special ed? I'd like to actually start there because I really want to emphasize that we're not tearing things down as much as refocusing. Um, we are serving, I think, six and a half million students now. About 13 or 14 percent of our school population, a lot more than the law intended. We have learned all kinds of ways of educating kids teaming up, um, trying to figure out how children learn, uh, using new ways of um, interventions earlier and earlier. Um, I think a lot of students have been successful. Uh, we have been, however, now to the problems. I should talk to you, shouldn't I? I'm well, like, you can look at, no, look at them. They're oh. more interesting than I am. <laughs> right. um, but I do so, want you to talk about so. the impact on general education, and then we'll get into the problems of special ed itself. Okay. Um, well, on general education, I would say there are two areas of great concern. Okay. One is the funding. Okay. Special ed is an unfunded, I mean, I, I shouldn't say unfunded, although some people think so, but it's a uncapped individual entitlement law, which means that whatever the local IEP team says the student needs, the public school is going to fund, no matter what their budget looks like. Uh, it's also true that we don't know how much is spent on special ed, really. And we are estimating, and that some of it is Fordham um, data, 
we are estimating that we spend somewhere between 21 and 40 percent of school budgets on educating children with disabilities. What do I mean? About 21 or so percent goes to special education services, whatever you get uh, through a special educator or a guidance, uh, not guidance, but um, services provided by licensed special ed folks. But the 40 percent is really that most children with disabilities spend most of their time in general education classrooms. And so I think if you're going to do honest accounting, you have to add in the special ed and the wider circle of general ed services for those kids. So one way that it affects public schools is that funding, a lot of funding goes to serve one um, specific set of students. But the part that I want to focus on, really, and the part I focus on in the book, is that so many of our special ed policies are driven by civil rights notions or notions of equality or notions of how life should be and not driven by pedagogy or what actually works. And I spent a lot of time talking about the issues that the inclusion policy is affect how it is affecting general ed students and also special ed students as um, you know as uh, many kids with disabilities whose parents adamantly are seeking not an inclusive setting. So I guess the bottom line for me is we need policies in education that are based on data and research and objective data, not someone's ideas of um, you know, how it would be nice to have it. And I think that's where I would start. Are you, are you seriously saying that we don't know how much it costs? I am. Nobody has a total budget that um, figure for the costs of special education in American K-12 education. Special we know how many kids have IEPs. Uh, we know what percentage of all the kids that is. Yeah. We know what total amount of money spent on public education is. Right. And then there's, uh, of course, ancillary costs from Medicaid it's, and other things. Well, I, I, to tell you the truth, one of the ways that I, I'm comfortable saying that I don't know is some of the data and some of the reports you, you folks have put out talking about the fact that the bottom line is we don't know what is spent. It comes from all different pockets, and all we can do, and again, I think I'm using uh, Fordham numbers, all we can do is estimate the cost of special ed services. And I, I've only seen one study, actually, that tries to also estimate the cost of general ed services for, for kids, kids with IEPs. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I've got a, the It is shocking to me, actually, that we don't know, because we collect a lot of data. I'll say. Yeah. I mean, it leads me to the wonder whether people don't want us to know, actually, whether this is something that is being, being kept from being totaled up. Um, uh, because the total might be might be terrifying. Um, the you you also suggest that the inclusion is maybe not working very well either for the kids with disabilities or for the other kids uh, in the classroom or for the teachers. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about inclusion and its consequences? Well, what I say very clearly is we don't know if it's working because no one is looking at whether or not it's working for the other kids. There was one study, as I was finishing the book, so I got it in, there was one study recently from the University of California in Santa Barbara by two guys, called them up, very excited, and they wanted to see how children in primary grades, kindergarten, were affected by having someone in the class with behavioral issues, an IEP for emotional behavioral disturbance. And the data was terrible. Um, in what sense? The data don't exist or the data were troubling? Troubling. OK. The, basically, what they found was that the other children in the class with these kids were absent more often, and their academic scores went down. Now, I called them up. I said, wow, this is unbelievable. I haven't seen data like this. It made the front page of Education Week, which I thought was a great venue for that. 
And I said to this guy, I think his name is Michael, I'm not sure, I said, Have you, are you continuing the studies? This is really important. And I said, no, 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 we're studying math now. So I don't know who else is studying it. Hmm. But I have to say, the point I want to make is I am not anti um, uh, inclusion per se, but I am for actually having data. So some of you picked up the um, the uh, editorial that I had out there from the Wall Street, Street Journal, Journal piece, yeah. And um, okay, and so after that piece came out about making this argument that we really need to know how it's affecting everyone, because we need to know if our public schools are working for everyone. And um, my sense is okay. So I got lots of emails and lots of hate mail and lots of love, love notes. You'll, get, you'll mean, get some more after today. It's a controversial issue. Um, and one woman wrote me and said that I was wrong, that there was a lot of data about this stuff. I said, that's awesome. That's fabulous. Send it to me. Let me know what it is. And again, I was very disappointed because the data the person sent, one was from an advocacy group, one was from an inclusion study place, and one was from... Uh, um, 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 a brief, an amicus brief for a lawsuit. So my point is, before we do this massive public policy that affects all kids everywhere, all schools, we really should know what we are doing. And in the book, I have, I think, a, a really excellent comparable study how many of you uh, grew up believing that uh, fat is bad for you? Fat is fat. bad for you. Exactly. Because for 50 years... didn't stop me, but I read it. Because for 50 years, the Department of um, uh, the Heart Association and the Department of Health sold us on the notion that fat is bad for you. It was sold to them, and there's an incredible story of how that, all that happened by a researcher who had really very poor ways of doing research. Come to find out now that how many of you now believe fat is good for you? Exactly. And in fact, Who's you shouldn't, the, you shouldn't We like eat, that finding. Exactly. No, no, no. Because when they said fat is bad for you, they said eat sugar and eat carbs. Mm. And all the cereal companies and everybody made positive money. And now we have obesity as an epidemic. And we have um, a lot of diabetes. My point is not that this is about fat. But my point is before we do a government policy that affects everyone, we really should know that we are doing the right thing for everyone. My focus is on all kids. All kids includes kids with disabilities, but it also includes all kids. So I want to come back for a minute to, to the future of public education, because while we are in a city that is trying to avoid talking about special ed, everybody's talking about vouchers. And one of the more provocative sort of lines in your book, in essence, is that uh, special ed is, 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 is helping to bring about a future of vouchers. Well, that, that's putting it, yeah, well, it's a thought. Let me, let me play it out and see what you think. Um, there are too many people, I believe, for, who's, uh, too many children whose parents think the schools are not serving them. In my own personal life experience, the children who really aren't served well are pretty much the average kids who don't act out, quiet kids who don't do a whole lot, as well as many talented, gifted classes unless they happen to live in lovely suburbs where they get served. The more we have programs that isolate or that focus on certain pockets of children, in my view, leaving too many parents out there thinking, this isn't working for my kid. There's no program for my kid. They're not focusing on my kid. And now comes along this whole notion that we can give you money so you can go somewhere else. It's pretty attractive. I personally am not for vouchers. Don't get me wrong, but it scares me to think that we are not focusing on all our students. And that really is the message I want to bring out. Um, the little word all is very complicated. It is 
very complicated. If you want me to go into that, I will, but if you want to have... <laughs> well, I want to push on one more voucher-related question. What about special ed vouchers, like uh, the statewide program in Florida, the autism scholarships that we, several states now have? Yeah. Uh, would this be a good thing, in your opinion? Um, I don't really have a strong opinion about it, uh, but I will say, let me say, uh, the system is so messed up so long as we stay with um, this law, with the entitlement, I actually don't have a problem with it if the, if the schools that these children go to are good. Now, if nobody's minding the store and whether or not the schools are good, that's a problem. Um, well, that's true of all say, voucher programs. But let me, uh, yeah, but the, the problem has also been, if we are honest about how we resolve disputes in special ed um, when, when families, we haven't even talked about how this works, how families can file a lawsuit against the school and make demands or requests, however you want to put it. Um, and most of those cases get resolved and settled by essentially a voucher, meaning the, the school and the parents write a cost share agreement I'll throw in $10,000, you put in $30,000, and we'll call it a day, or we'll split the tuition. So I think it's complicated, and I sh you know what I should have done if I was more experienced in public speaking and things like this, I would have said, I don't really get into vouchers. It's not my area of expertise, and let it at that. But mm. it has bothered me, I have to say, that on the settlements, those who can pay to play have always played the game, and those who can't, can't. Well, that's, of course, one of the arguments that school choice people make for more vouchers is that wealthy people can already afford to send their kids to the school of their choice. Yeah, but vouchers are not my, um, All right. my area All right. of expertise. But we'll, turn, we'll, we'll, and, and, we'll and drop that for the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you keep referring to ending the entitlement. So let's go to this core point. Um, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, so, in the book, I lay out w what I see are the successes of the law and what I see are its challenges. And then I'm thinking, how are we going to resolve this? We're always going to want to educate kids with disabilities. I am, I'm, th it's not about the children, so they're all in, they're all going to get their services. But how do we end the dysfunction of the law? And I believe the dysfunction comes from the way this law was set up. Now I'm going to ask you a question, and if I haven't given you the answer today, then perhaps you can tell it. So this is an entitlement statute. That is, the parents of kids with disabilities and the children have a legal entitlement to a free, appropriate public education and to all the procedural uh, requirements and all the notices and paperwork galore. And who, extra services and extra resources. Right. Yes. Who, so when you have an entitlement, who's the enforcer? That's the question. You can't answer it. You can't answer it. Who is the enforcer of this law? And you can't answer it. <laughs> yes. The parent. So this law set up a antagonistic, argumentative, I'm looking for the other A word. Um, adversarial. adversarial. Thank you. You're a lawyer. Come on. Adversarial. <laughs> That's what you, yeah. That's what I do. Adversarial system. Right in the classrooms. Right in the school. And I believe that our issues, the reason we have so much paperwork and so much data is because people are practicing defensive education. Teachers are petrified of being called down to uh, you know, a hearing and so on and so on. So that's kind of the background. Um, the way I see this law, we succeeded. All children are getting services. About 20 years into this law, it should have had a sunset provision. It should have been ended because we won the access battles. My friend's sister, who was not allowed to go to school in New York City, that does not happen anymore just because she had Down syndrome, okay? Um, it should have had a sunset provision. It didn't. In my view, 
these children are in school, no one's gonna, they're not going to not be in school, and we need to move on to a 2.0. But I want to put a caveat on that really quickly. I want to be really careful. Because uh, that's pretty radical. I mean, I'm surprised. If I you... said repeal and replace. You said sunset. But uh, keep going. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Um, keep but going. Because I want to know where we're going with but, the 2.0 and how it's different. But it, all right, it, they are different. Uh, OK. Um, I've lost my train of thought. All right. Uh, we were. You, no, no, no. This is the point I wanted to make. I'm back. Um, when I say we should end the entitlement, I am talking about 80 or 90 percent of students only. I'm not talking about all kids with disabilities. I want to be really clear. When the law was written, it was written for children essentially with severe and profound needs. Now, this, the kinds of students we serve are 80 or 90 percent of them have mild and moderate needs. Most of the time they spend in education is in public, I'm um, sorry, in general education classrooms. 10 or 20 percent of the students have severe and profound needs that are often complicated, difficult to, um, to serve, and so on. You mean 10 or 20 percent of the kids with IEPs who are in special ed? Okay, right. go ahead. And my sense about how to move forward is to uh, call a task force or call some kind of a study to figure out how to proceed with that smaller number of students. Maybe we must bring in other social agencies or other medical agencies. These issues are complicated. So when I'm talking about the uh, um, Ending the entitlement, I'm talking about the children who are essentially in general ed classes with services, pull out sometimes, but often in the classroom. OK, well, that's an important distinction. Um, and uh, for how would, so talk first about how it would continue to work or work in the future for those kids with the more serious disabilities. I don't know. You don't know? No. I mean, that's what I think, I think it's a real challenge. Um, I think schools have done a good job, but I think But you would maintain some kind of an entitlement for them. I, I don't know. I would say that until we know how we want to proceed, let's study it, and then the entitlement continues. Yeah. OK. And I'm very clear. I mean, the, the, I'm laying out ideas as I think about this field. And some things I'm very confident and comfortable in discussing. Other things are not, and that would be one of them. I think that. Plenty of really excellent people in the field and experts and other people who can figure out how to proceed forward. But just because we wrote this system in 1975 doesn't mean it's still working in 2017. I understand that. And I, I even remember that uh, Gerald Ford s said when he signed it that he had misgivings about how it was going to play out over the long haul. Um, and he, and uh, th that, was, that was very clear 40 years ago that he said that anyway. I wasn't clear how it was going to play out. Um, someone pointed out to me the other day that in uh, other OECD type advanced countries, uh, that more like 6% of the kids are getting special ed type services instead of our 13 or 14%. That could be. And um, I'm going to guess, but tell me if you know differently, that that is because the more severe uh, disabilities are the ones being served with special ed services in those countries. I, yeah, I, I, I would not. But the other interesting statistic that people might be interested mm -hmm. in is in our country, um, Different states have very, very, very different identification rates. And well, we've we, seen we some go of the... from a low of 9%, 10%, 11 to a high of 18 um, Yeah, we did a Fortnum report a little while ago on that, which showed the range from, as I recall, Texas to Massachusetts. Right. Um, and Rhode Island, New Jersey. And yeah. then there was, of course, a big scandal repeal, re re revealed in Texas uh, a year or so ago. Um, that they were supposedly putting a cap or quota on their on their special ed identification. The and you know, and someone else brought brought that story up to us as we were talking to folks, because they're saying, well, if you don't have the entitlement, how do we protect children mm -hmm. from that? And mm -hmm. it's a really good question, and it's something that we would think about. But um, that doesn't mean we need this entitlement system as a way to fix it. No, I get that, but you're not quite willing to say what to replace it with. Oh, what to replace it with. <laughs> Sorry. 
but that's kind of key if we're not going to have the entitlement as we have it now. Well, again, let me back up as to why I wrote this book. Uh, and you're going to be unhappy because I will not have the answer. Okay. But I wrote the book because I was extremely concerned that issues of fundamentally what are we doing are not discussed. They are, they are taboo. People don't, you know, you don't get general ed parents and special ed parents together talking about this stuff. And I think it's more than high time that we do that. So the book, if you look at the cover, it basically is an urgent call for a national conversation. Because I think once we can actually talk about these issues, we can figure them out. Now, obviously, if we're not going to have individualized IEPs with the threat of lawsuits in classrooms, we'll have to come up with other ways of ensuring that children get served. But honestly, I think that's true for all kids. And you know, people say, well, we don't have good data on good objective data on um, outcomes for kids with disabilities. And honestly, how is our data for all kids? I mean, so part of the thing is that if we're going to have children in general ed classrooms most of the time with um, whatever services they need coming in or going out, um, I think they need to be part of the mix of general ed. Well, as you know, particularly since you live in Silicon Valley, there's quite a lot of push going on around the country for personalized learning for everybody, right. including Mark Zuckerberg and the Shan Zuckerberg Initiative and so forth and so on. Um, wouldn't a serious move toward personalized learning be akin to special ed for everybody? Yeah, I mean, I wish it, yeah, it would. And again, I'm not, I've thought about this only a little bit. I'm not an expert on personalized learning, but I do have my skepticism. There are skepticism. none, as far as I can tell. I have my skepticism, especially since it's coming out of Silicon Valley. I, <laughs> you moved there voluntarily. Technology. Well, I didn't move there for this personalized learning. <laughs> uh, but let me, tell, let me tell you what I think does work and what I'm actually, and it is a form of personalized learning, and I'm sure that it uses technology. Um, and I, let me push it a little bit just to show you that there are other ways of, um, of dealing with different children learning at different rates and having different interests. Um, so the, the, the policy that the federal government is pushing and the policy this law pushes is uh, a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, right. the LRE. And that's where this whole issue of inclusion comes in. But there are some schools out there doing another L word, thingamajig, and it's called L-I-N. And it's called Least Intervention Necessary. And these are the people who are really pushing proficiency-based instruction, very much like personalized mm -hmm. learning, um, and allowing children to work at their own weights and be challenged at their own weights, whether they are behind grade level or whatever that's going to be, or very advanced. Uh, I really was enamored when I met this young man in Colorado, uh, because he's doing it in uh, Westminster County School District. And I was enamored because he doesn't call his teachers special educators or gifted and talented teachers, but all the teachers are interventionists and they work with all children. And I was happy to see that they took the gamut, English language learners, special ed, gifted and talented, all of them um, receiving interventions at their levels. So that is like personalized Very learning. Very much. Uh, but I don't know that they are sitting in front of computers all day long. No, no, I, know, I don't think. No, no, but here's the difference. Personalized learning very often is being sold, at least as I understand it, as a way of making inclusion work. So that in a classroom, the teacher can differentiate for all kinds of learners. I am skeptical. What this LIN is, it's not about LRE. It's about the child learning. And, you know, and, and he might be with one kid in math, but a different kid in English, depending on how they're doing. So if personalized learning is about helping kids wherever they're sitting in the school, 
that's one thing. But I believe a lot of times it's being used to promote LRE in the classroom, and you have 27 learning styles, and which don't and, exist. And put the label of differentiated instruction over the whole thing. No, I, agree, I hear you, and I and if it if it men, means that, I I got my doubts too. Yeah. Uh, if it means individualization of kids moving at their own speed with appropriate instruction according to where they are and and what they need to learn and right. how fast they're learning it and how they look, go about learning it, it seems to me that makes total sense for everybody though. Um, um, in, 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 for ever, literally for everybody. So um, you mentioned states, and this was another area I wanted to get into. Um, why not with special ed, as ESSA has just done with Title I, turn special ed over to the states, either entirely or allowing experimentation? and innovation at the state level for states that want to, let's call them giant waivers, uh, so they can try something different in their state, not necessarily turning it over willy-nilly to all states like it or not. What about some state involvement here? I, I do raise the issue in the book, too. Um, but I, all I do is I raise the issue. I don't have the answer. Is that the way to go? I don't know. Well, it's not an, uh, but this I will isn't tell you, an answer question. This is a should we try it question. I should we try it? Should states that think they could innovate and do it differently be allowed yeah. to do so? I, I think, yeah. Well, I mean, asked that way, of course they should. But um, the the other side will argue that how, who's going to protect individual rights? I understand. So, that was a similar yeah. argument to what we just went through with us, which is who's going to look after uh, uh, disadvantaged kids if you turn it over to states who don't like them. I have a lawsuit in the making, sort of embarrassing to raise it here, but okay. You have a lawsuit in the making? Because uh, I'm thinking Against whom? If we, don't, if we don't do that, if we don't allow the ESSA yeah. devolution of responsibility from the feds down to the states, but we only keep special ed, isn't that kind of discriminatory against them and their teachers and well could be um, anyway it's something worth pursuing and again my goal is to open a conversation so that is an important discussion point who should be running this thing should it be the federal government still in the bureaucracy here in Washington or should it be done at the states what would be the relation between the federal government and the states all that to be worked out well, before yes. we open the conversation yeah. to the people in the room and our worldwide audience um, let me let me ask you this. Why has it been taboo? Why are we talking about everything else in education except this? What is the source of the taboo? People just don't want a lot of small children in wheelchairs and crutches to be on their doorstep? What is the taboo? Um, that, that's a great question. Well, answer it. <laughs> I think I think the way the law was set out with this private enforcement system, there was a whole advocacy world claiming to be the people who are defending the most vulnerable children. It is very difficult for general ed people to raise any questions about that without being or uh, feeling like they are opposed to the most vulnerable children. I think it has not been in a loud discussion. It's always shocked me, actually, that because I, I was in private practice representing school districts. Well, they serve everybody. They don't just serve special ed kids. They serve why there was so little pushback from the general ed community, and there really was. So. Well, it isn't just that. It's also politicians don't want to touch it. Nobody don't. in Congress wants to yeah. touch it. Right. No, none right. of the private foundations, incidentally, want to touch it. Right. Incidentally, when we've gone seeking grants for studies of special ed, nobody will. Nobody wants to fund it either. Well, because we have very powerful um, interest groups supporting it on all sides, uh, especially. I don't know. I think. I think it's been a really taboo. So I'd like to kind of slide the conversation and bring in general ed people. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say um, that I've been very heartened, actually, in this journey. Um, it's just little old me putting out what I'm thinking and sharing it. But I do believe that there's, a, there's more of an openness and a more of a willingness to take a look at trying to do things in a new way. And I gave a talk last year in, in uh, California 
And I was invited to speak, and I said, about these issues, and I said, I will only come if you get as many general ed people in the audience as we have special ed people. Because normally when we talk about special ed, it's all about amongst ourselves, the special ed world. And they did that, and I have to say, it was the most open-ended, powerful, positive, exciting um, discussion. I think people are ready to take a look at this because there are many people in the special ed community who don't like the way it works. There are many parents who don't want to be fighting all the time against their school districts. And for many parents, I mean, I think of my immigrant mother, um, my cousin is sitting here, my immigrant mother who I wanted to change grades in my little elementary school in Flemington, New Jersey. And that woman, as educated as she was, would never go to the school and ask for anything because the school people are the experts. And so we have a lot of parents who don't participate in the system. I mean, they're afraid to ask and demand. So I think a lot of people realize that perhaps there could be a better way. And I was very heartened by the discussion we had in Southern California. That's contributed to your in. sense that there's a readiness to begin I to think have so. this conversation. I think okay, so. well, yeah. I hope that very much that your book kicks it off and that you were right that the conversation will, will, will occur. Because uh, I certainly think it's overdue. As I said, um, 16 years ago, we were recommending uh, such, a, such an overhaul and uh, we didn't get much response. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about it, uh, so I hope I hope they do now. So let us uh, turn to uh, those of you who were kind enough to come today, and anybody that's watching, uh, use the Twitter. Uh, once again, I gave you the hashtag earlier, and I certainly don't remember it. Um, but so let's start with the people in the room. Uh, questions, uh, not speeches. Yes, and identify yourself, please, and then um, speak. And there's a actually a mic because we're broadcasting to the worldwide audience. <coughs> So, uh, do you have a live mic? Okay, can you Go hear me? It. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Patrick Lenahan. Uh, I'm a former school board member. I'm a parent uh, of uh, five children, and I just take a little bit of an issue with your comment that you don't have general education and special education parents equally engaged, because frequently the special education parents are also general education That's parents. True. Uh, I've got five children, two of them were special education, one had a moderate uh, or mild uh, disability and she is now an elementary school teacher out here in Northern Virginia and another one, one of my sons was severe and profound. So I think that you've got that engagement that you want, so maybe you could comment on that. Engagement that, even within the family you're suggesting. In, in the yeah. Family? yeah. No, I think okay. that's, a, that's a great point and I, I, I appreciate you making it. Um, yeah. no, um, it's very hard to label, you know, you, you, you talk in shorthand, and I think I was doing that, but I really do, yeah, 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 good point, yeah. My name is Mark Holman. I was a teacher in Norfolk, and also I was a teacher in D.C. at H.T. Wilson High School, but now I'm an edu education advocate for a law firm who we help the parents of special ed kids if they want to file a due process hearing. And so the the hearing officers in these also I see, uh, you know, so the both sides battle it out, and the hearing officer decides what to do. And so from there, he maybe he will, you know, we'll, we, if we win, maybe placement or in, in a private placement. Okay. So um, I have, you know, being a te teacher in Norfolk, and I also I have a disability, so that's my speech is, is affected a little bit. But anyway, so uh, now I work up the street, right. Brown Associates, and so that's my job. Also, teacher certifications, because I found to, to, be, to be an advocate, uh, some teachers are not certified in special ed. Hmm. So when you, we go to a hearing, I get the teacher certifications from Aussie and found out, oh, this teacher is not certified in special ed at all. So, so like, sometimes we win by default for that fact. Okay. So, that, so also, I, before I was a teacher in Norfolk, I was a counselor at Grafton School for autistic kids. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, uh, I had to do the care plan as, as okay. well. So I have, you know, so my master's degree is from Cambridge in Boston, 
and my undergraduate is from Hampton. Is this turning into a question for uh, I just I just wanted to know, um, regarding special ed now, we have Betsy DeVos. We do. And, and so I don't know, so I looked on the web page, and it's gone. What's gone? The uh, special ed website is gone. Well, it was like gone At the two Department weeks ago. Of education? Yeah, it was gone. So okay, so it's bad because I called it, it so I could, you can still call the number, but I said, well, why is it disappeared? I don't think Miriam erased it. <laughs> anyway. I was there yesterday. They were all there. Okay. At Oso. They were all there. Okay. Um, so it's back, apparently, or at least. Well, I hope, hope right. so. There are a lot of people. Because parents want. A lot of people need, in the room saying it's back. P p people, parents especially need to know what to do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think that's um, At some point, you were a hearing officer, weren't you? Wasn't that part of your career? I was. I was. For eight years, I was a hearing officer in Massachusetts. It was probably a formative experience. It was awesome. I loved it. I loved all of it. Teaching. All right. All right. We've got other people who are in the room. Um, who else has a uh, query? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike to here. Mike to Mike. Are you Mike? I'm Mike. Thank you. I'm Mike Kurtzig, also an educator after my career in agriculture. Education is a big problem in this country. And one of the biggest problems is there are millions of jobs going begging in this country. That's, that's one side of it. Right. But I wanted to ask also, and this is not my field, obviously, are we training enough teachers in special ed and other to face the problem that is in class? Because you hear all kinds of stories mm -hmm. that they're not prepared to, to, to meet the challenge and to meet the need. So what is the situation now? Yeah. On the teacher training of side the teacher of training yeah. to be prepared okay. for yeah. Talk about that. We haven't talked about that at all. Yeah. Please. No, I, we have not talked about it. I didn't write about it. Um, I think... Um, just talking to people, yes, it's a big issue. I'm not the expert on that. Uh, but I want to go back to um, I want to go back to your first point. A lot of jobs go begging, and I do live in Silicon Valley, where sometimes I feel like, as an like a American, I'm a minority. I mean, there are a lot of people from all over the world working there, and the question is, why why are they coming, and are we educating enough? people of high tech and science and STEM and so on. And how does it relate to this? I do believe it relates to this. Um, I believe our policies, including special ed, but not only, are focusing so much on um, kids who are not, you know, what we call closing the gap, kids who are not yet proficient on standards that may or may not even be high enough for, for life. And I don't think we focus enough on, as I said earlier, kids who already are proficient and need more challenges. And I think that plays into the jobs situation. Others in the room? Uh, yes, sir. Bart Devon from Autism Speaks. Um, I have a logistical. My name is Bart Devon. I am the manager of public policy at Autism Speaks. Oh, good. My, my question is about the line that you've drawn between special ed students who spend most of their time yeah. in the general education atmosphere versus pull out. Yeah. Um, without an entitlement system, how will you know where to draw that line? And if you want to deny services to those kids who, are, who spend most of their time in the general setting, uh, who are receiving services and making the most uh, headway at the least taxpayer cost, why? Well, you packed a lot into that. I appreciate the question. I want to be really clear. I'm not about denying services to anybody. I've been clear about that. I've always been clear. It is not about the children. I want the children served, OK? Uh, so that's number one. In term, You asked me about pull out and percentages. Well, you did I distinguish also, yeah. between the kids who are mostly in the regular, generally, right. classroom. It's not so much to pull. I'm trying to distinguish between two groups of students, the yes. ones who are not following the general curriculum most of the time. It is fascinating to me, actually, that the Supreme Court decision that just came out about three weeks ago, Andrew F. versus Douglas County from Colorado, unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> way that they went about discussing it, which is very much in line with my discussion of the two groups of students. 
So for those of you who are not as up on legal stuff, um, th there was a case about a family in Colorado who believed the public school was not providing their child with a free, appropriate public education. The child was, um, had autism, and he was not, I mean, autism is a wide spectrum disorder, so some of the kids are, you know, high functioning, low functioning, whatever. He was not in general education standard classes. Um, and the, the question was, what level of services was he entitled to? But in writing the decision, the court did two things. They said the level of entitlement to him was something where he could make progress in accordance with his circumstances. But they differentiated his situation from the old case, which was decided back in 1982, the first case out of the box for this law, special ed law, the Rowley decision for a girl who was, who was functioning in general ed classes and doing fine, not maximizing her potential, but doing well. And the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago differentiated these two groups. Um, there may be something there. And, you know, I mean, obviously my book came out before the Supreme Court decision. But again, in the call for conversation, I think it's important to be open to the possibility of how do we best serve all children. But I want to be really clear. It's not about not serving some kids. But you're saying that, I mean, he was asking about how do you draw a line. And, oh, I um, yeah. and, and you're saying the court did a version of that they in this did, decision? They actually did, yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of surprising for those of us who've been thinking about this situation that these children really do have different needs and not everyone because um, all of the one size does not fit all, all of the reporting and I only read the reporting I didn't read the decision seemed to say the court re recommended more services for this child well let's be clear yes they did well I mean not to get into the weeds but to go into the weeds because I think it's important to be clear not to get into the um, weeds but let's go into the weeds right. keep going uh, so in so the, the lawyers and the, uh, and the Colorado Tenth Circuit decision, the Tenth Circuit had said the, the law only requires, requires nothing more than a merely de minimis progress. That was the that was appeals, what, Court of Appeals. Right, Tenth Circuit. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 that's really way too little. We don't have this, you know, million dollars, a billion dollars of um, structure in order to help kids merely de minimis. However, the, the situation is, those of us in education law, and Sonia, you can, none of us, I mean, I think a lot of us were uncomfortable with a merely de minimis idea. I mean, I practiced law forever in Massachusetts, and our standard always was a meaningful benefit standard, mm -hmm. or sometimes the court would say a measurable benefit. So I don't know how much difference it's going to make in the practice in most jurisdictions, actually. Time will tell. Okay. Others? Or Twitter? Twitter? Um, anybody? Um, Getting close to final opportunities. I just want to say one more thing. One, all right, meanwhile, they're going to bring in drinks and maybe some snacks. The drinks lady is here. All right. Uh, thank you, Karen. One more thing. So the IP team decides uh, if the, you know, how many hours this kid is going to be having inclusion. Maybe it's reading, math, and written expression. Right for the core uh, special ed subjects and then history and other stuff uh, in the probably you know general ed ed oh. education so so the IEP team decides what to do and how how many hours is on the IEP yep that's all okay thank you got it understood um, anybody else before we uh, before we wind down let me uh, uh, repeat that um, uh, this book is worth reading, uh, it is worth buying, um, and uh, the conversation is absolutely worth having. I don't know whether anybody in the executive branch, uh, in the current administration, Betsy DeVos or otherwise, is going to have the, uh, the, the, the imagination and the guts to uh, take this on as an issue in any fashion. 
I don't know whether anyone in the Congress is going to uh, take this on in any fashion. I'd like, um, yeah. I, I'd like to say a word about that. I mean, please. Thank you for supporting the conversation. Um, I think it's pre personally, I think it's premature to go to Betsy DeVos or the Congress. Okay. I think the conversation needs to happen among us, among people in the field, people in the community. Um, allow the discussion to happen. Let's see where it goes. Some of the questions that I couldn't answer because we, you know, I don't have the answer. Uh, hopefully that'll come out. And once we have a sense of how we want to proceed, then I think it's a good time to um, go to Congress. You're, you're, I'm glad you're optimistic. Um, the we in your sentence um, is not clear to me that there's a consensus waiting to be found, mm -hmm. but um, I can see a lot of contention ahead in this realm. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it is surely worth a try, because mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about kids who, who, who need an education, and we're talking about taxpayers who need their money to be well spent, and we're talking about a country that needs a better educated uh, population. So for all of these reasons, this is a conversation worth having. I hope it gets us somewhere. Meanwhile, um, the, the snacks have arrived, the wine and beer are here. And thank you very much, uh, Miriam, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. And thanks, all of you, for joining us today. And please help yourselves and stick around. Oh, thank you. No. Happy to do. That was fun. Uh, let me turn this off. <laughs>